offering something called multiple integrals. Uh, multiple integrals are going to allow us to do things like volumes underneath surfaces instead of just areas under curves. But there's a few other applications. We'll see a couple of those applications here in the very first section. 15.1, uh, we're going to introduce the idea of a um, multiple integral by describing kind of the same Riemann sum approach that we did in uh, functions of one variable. Now we're going to be talking about functions of two variables. So specifically we're going to talk about double integrals. Later in this chapter we'll introduce something called triple integrals as well um, for other types of applications. But for the most part we're going to stick to a geometric interpretation of our integrals and think of them in terms of volumes under surfaces. So let's go back and remember how we defined the definite integral back in calculus one when we first introduced the idea of the integral um, specifically the definite integral not the indefinite integral remember when you think of the indefinite integral you are thinking of um, the antiderivative of a function and with the definite integral we're specifically thinking about the uh, area underneath a curve um, it's the fundamental theorem of calculus that allows us to connect those two concepts and find the definite integral by finding first the indefinite integral and then plugging in the limits and subtracting. But you'll recognize this picture. I'm actually going to just use some images uh, borrowed from our textbook instead of drawing these by hand on the screen. Let's consider a function, which is this blue curve here. And it's going to be defined from some interval a to b. We want to find the area underneath the curve, so we begin by approximating it. And we're going to do this in the standard way of taking that interval from a to b and dividing it into equal subintervals. We're going to count those up and do n equal subintervals. And if we divide it equally, we're going to declare that this delta x is the size of each subinterval. So it's the length from x minus 1 to x, sorry, x sub i minus 1 to xi. So for any interval, say this one right here, you see my mouse, hopefully you can see my mouse moving right there. Um, I think I could draw with the pen here. This interval right here, that length is what we call delta x, what I've described right there. Okay. So then what you do is you pick a point out of each subinterval, like this point, this point, this point, and so on, and measure the height of the curve at that point and draw a rectangle whose width is delta x and whose height is the function value at that point. Just go up there, right? F sub x, one star would be this height right here. And then what we do is we find the area of each rectangle. And so, like this ith rectangle, the area would be the height, which is f of x i star times delta x. But then that's the area of this one. So that's like the ith area. And so we sum all of those up. Now, if we put those in here for every possible i, take the sum, then this sum right here is the sum of all of these rectangles, which is an approximate area, not the exact area. It's approximate because there's holes in here. So then you take the limit as n goes to infinity. And since we're doing equally spaced subintervals, then we're going to get infinitely many, infinitely close together. You add all those up. This approaches what we define to be the integral of the function from a to b. That's called the Riemann integral. Okay, So it's the sum of rectangles where we take the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. That's the definite integral for a function of just one variable, right? One variable right here. So how are we going to define volumes and double integrals? So in a similar manner, we're going to consider now a function f of two variables. So f is going to be f of x, y. And let's consider for now that it's defined on some closed interval, which I'm going to call a, b cross with c, d. So this rectangle down here, this r, 
goes from A to B in the X direction and goes from C to D in the Y direction. And so this notation that I have underlined here is the same as saying the set of all points X, Y in R2 such that the X value is between A and B, that is the X coordinate is between A and B, and the Y coordinate is between C and D. Um, just for now, we'll assume that F of X and Y is greater than or equal to zero, but we can loosen this restriction later. It will help me in the way that I describe my pictures here. Just note that whenever F and of X, Y goes negative, we'll be talking about negative areas if it falls underneath the X, Y plane. So the graph of F, right, of this F here, is this surface in blue, right? So that's the way I've got this drawn. We want to describe this, air, this volume that's underneath S. So think of these vertical lines right here as the four corners, the four edges of a volume, a block. All right, it's almost, I always use the, uh, in my mind, I'm thinking of a big block of cheese. Okay, it's a big block of something uh, that that has this shape on top but it's got a rectangle over which it's defined this R. So I want to find the volume of this S which is that volume underneath that curve. So here's how I do that. I'm going to take this rectangle R down here in figure 2 and I'm going to divide it into equal intervals this way. That's taking my S uh, sorry, my R, and dividing the Y axis into equal subintervals. I'm going to do the same thing in the X direction and divide it into then a bunch of sub rectangles. Now I've drawn that on the next page so it's a little bit easier to see. This is my X axis here. This is my Y axis here. I've gone from X equals A to X equals B, Y equals C to y equals d and then I divide the x-axis into equal pieces in the x direction all of length delta x delta x would then be b minus a over however many pieces I go in that direction okay um, we'll say n okay and if I go in the y direction I'm going to divide the interval c to d into equal pieces this way and so this would be c minus d over however many pieces that way say m so I have then a total of m times n sub rectangles in each direction. And then out of each sub rectangle, notice how like for example this sub rectangle here is made up of the interval from x1 to x2 and y1 to y2, right? So it would be um, like that one in red would be x1 comma x2 cross with y1 comma y2 right I'm gonna pick a point out of that one and I'm gonna call it a test point so if I were to label this one I would call that x comma 2 2 star and y comma 2 2 star representing this is the second rectangle in the x direction and in the y direction so that's 2 2 and then I'm going to pick a point out of there, call it x star, y star, and there are then again m times n test points. Okay, so pick one of these intervals, like this is the i jth sub rectangle. It's the ith interval in the x direction, it's the jth interval in the y direction, so I would call this rectangle capital R sub ij, and then the point in here I'm going to call xij star and yij star. Then what I want to do is I want to evaluate this function, the original function f of xy at each one of those points. Now why am I going to do that? Well, look at this picture down here. So here's all of my sub rectangles. There's the rij sub rectangle. My uh, sample point is xij star yij star. If I plug that into the function, that's this height of the surface. And so what I'm going to do then is find the volume of this sub rectangle prism. Oop, go back. Sorry. And this piece right here, that C column, is going to have a volume that is equal to the 
height of the column times the area of the base. Now the area of the base is going to be delta x times delta y because it's this rectangle right here which has dimensions delta y in this direction and delta x in this direction. So the volume of that vertical column is the function at my test point times the area of the base. So then to find a volume underneath the whole surface, we add up all of those rectangles. So you take it to the limit. You, sub you repeat for each one, and you get all these rectangles, and you add them up. You add them up in the x direction and then the y direction. So over all m and n of them, you get this volume. So v here is the volume under the surface. It would be approximately equal to the sum of all of these columns. And so to get the actual integral, we would then take it to the limit. The double integral of a function f over a rectangle r has this formula. Right here is the area, sorry, the volume under any, uh, sorry, over each subrectangle. Then you add them all up for all the subrectangles, and then you take the limit. So those are the pieces that make up what we're going to define as the double integral. Now notice my notation here. I'm using two integral symbols to represent a double integral. So we're now talking volumes instead of areas. I use a, for now, and I'll, I'll change this notation in a minute, I'm going to use an R for this rectangle base, right? So I take the double integral over R of my function f of x, y, and then dA is just a symbol to represent that I'm doing a volume under a surface over a bunch of little areas. And so if that limit exists, we call the function integrable. So this is the definition, right? That's important to remember. This is not any clue as to how to evaluate it. It's only the definition of the function or of the double integral. So in just a moment, we're going to talk about how we actually evaluate this. We can get from this a, uh, a technique for approximating integrals, um, like the left-hand rectangle rule and the right-hand rectangle rule and the trapezoid rule. There's techniques that allow us to do similar things. Um, in fact, I'll teach you the midpoint rule today um, to be able to approximate an integral. And then by the end of class today, you'll be able to actually find one by hand using integration, using anti-differentiation. All right, I'm going to stop there for this short video, and then um, we'll look at how to do this in a couple of subsequent videos.